Not because it's simply some um, academic nuance, it's because the conditions always exist to exploit workers and therefore to work for workers to fight back. And, um, you know, whether somebody is um, researching into games or pharmaceuticals, whether they work in a Weetabix factory or they're making aeroplanes, whether they're cleaners or teachers, every these people are exploited and they have common cause. The third story that's become um, very popular on the left as a kind of recipe for terrible difficulties and the impossibility of organizing has the is the idea that work has become more precarious under neoliberal capitalism now joseph chinara has written an excellent and very um, forensic book on this so i'm not going to cover that ground but one of the arguments that i make is that it ignores history and it assumes that there was some golden age of working class cohesion, community, solidarity and safe jobs. But I'm just going to tell one story to try and dismantle this rosy view of the past. And that's about Sports Direct. And I doubt if there are many people at this meeting who don't remember that Sports Di Direct Warehouse was one of the most notorious workplaces in Britain. Usually migrant workers from Eastern Europe working under terrible conditions, queuing up to be searched and not being paid for it, sexually and very precarious because um, they uh, because they were employed by subcontractors. Now, there's some very interesting continuity here, and that is that literally, if we scratch beneath the surface of Sports Direct, it was built on the site of an old mine, uh, coal mine, which closed in 1993. Now, the assumption that mining communities were these were all sites of solidarity and collectivity is really um, exposed by the fact that there was something called the Butty system until 1945. A series of subcontractors were paid by the mine owners and they employed and hired men on a daily basis. Now that was not a recipe for solidarity. It was a recipe in the villages and communities for nepotism and exploitation. And in the words of one of the miners who opposed it, he said it was um, that men often had to sacrifice the virtue of their wives and daughters to get work. So the similarities between the mining community um, at the beginning of the century and Sports Direct is really quite uncanny. So there are lots of other examples, um, but just fast forwarding very quickly people quite often use this idea of a standard contract that existed after the second world war and it did for some people but if you're a builder if you're a docker if you're a film worker then you are constantly having to fight against the casualization of your industry women and migrant workers were not part of this so-called privilege club at all and again did not share mostly did not share in this standard contract so quite a long answer to the first question mark but just to sum that up one of marx's contributions was that capitalism is a dynamic system it looked different in 1945 in 1970 and in 2020 it's constantly changing with some jobs in decline and new jobs um, arriving. And what that does is it always brings new challenges for trade unionists, socialists and activists. Thanks, Jane. Um, 
and in fact to, to sort of pick up where you ended there um because i think especially the first few chapters of your book make very powerful that argument that as you just explained that neoliberal capitalism far from eroding the power of workers constantly recreates the potential power of workers in the 21st century so the question then is about using that power um, so I want to turn to the to the trade unions, which again you spend quite a bit of time discussing. Um, now you know probably everybody on this call is is all too familiar with uh, the fact that the, the trade union movement in, in Britain today is is certainly smaller and arguably weaker than it has been at certain points in in the past. Um, now there's a, there's a growing debate, not not least in the unions themselves, about how we can rebuild trade union organisation in Britain. Um, and and I think that the recent victory of Sharon Graham for the Unite General Secretary election, with her call, her, really her key slogan was "Back to the Workplace," I, I think will increase this debate about how we rebuild the unions. And certainly inside the unions, anyone familiar? there's been a lot of talk about something called the organizing agenda, which you discuss in your book. So I suppose my question is, what in your assessment are the, the strengths and the weaknesses of the current approaches to rebuilding union organization? And, and how do you think socialists should intervene in such debates? Okay, I, th I think that's a really important question. It's very, very live um, amongst socialists and within trade unions themselves. And this idea of an organizing model um, really came from the United States and particularly um, the Service Employee International Union. And their hallmark was the idea that they should turn away from a, a professional um, hierarchy in trade unions that bargained on behalf of passive members to focus really hard on recruitment involving and activating their members. Now, there's a book that is um, circulating, um, written a few years ago by Jane McAlevey, and that's called No Shortcuts, Organising for Power. And when I was doing interviews and talking to activists, I found that it was extremely popular because she argues for wresting power away from deal makers and building a base of ordinary members. And very quickly, there are three strands to her argument. That you find organic leaders in the workplace that people relate to and respect. Thinking about the lessons of the Chicago teachers, she underlines the importance of community. And third, she talks about testing the ground to see if people are prepared to take high risk action, i.e. going on strike. Now, my reading of Jane McAlevey's uh, book is that there are left and right, right, left and right wing readings of it. There's no doubt that we have to give her credit for inspiring many union full timers and workplace reps because I came across them. But I think we have to say some of those fundamentals of organising are not new. I think a lot of us will say that the bread and butter of organising is involving people, recruiting them to the union, involving them in activity, and particularly in the light of draconian legislation, we can't get these things wrong. But I think there's also a right wing version of Jane McAlevey's work, and I think that there can be um, a rather mechanical and conservative interpretation of her arguments. For example, the idea of a magic number of people that you have to hit to take action can be used very easily as an excuse not to take any action at all. And again, what it ignores is past and present history where you've had a small group of workers who've come out on strike and a dispute explodes and snowballs. And two examples come to mind. Going back to the 1970s, um, women who worked in, in um, clothing factories in Leeds walked out on an official strike and they went from factory to factory, pulling out other workers, completely unofficially, completely without any plan. 
There's a more modest example, but I think it's important from a couple of years ago. And that is that the cleaners and caterers from the government department called Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy came out on indefinite strike. Now, if you'd asked me at the time whether they could win, probably I'd have said no. But what they did is they managed to engender such enthusiasm. New people wanted to join the union. New groups in the workplace came out on strike. There was incredible solidarity and they won. You know, that was a David and Goliath struggle that if you looked at the beginning of the dispute, you'd have thought they couldn't have win, won it, but they actually did. So I think we have to be very careful about that. And we've got to be very careful about not always knowing, thinking that we know in advance who the activists are. Struggles throw up new leaders. And in all the disputes where I talk to workers, um, there were new people who'd never been involved before and they'd grown in confidence and they were transformed. Thanks, Jane. Um... I mean, I think I just, you've touched on it, but I think that, uh, you know, there's this very prevalent idea um, that in the past, <clears throat> that there was almost a kind of, everybody worked in a factory, everyone worked in large workplaces, everyone was on common conditions, and that class consciousness and solidarity was almost kind of, almost automatic inside the working class. A sort of picture that there was once this homogenous working class, usually assumed or presented as male and white. And then you get a picture that somehow all of this has been swept aside today, that it's a much more fragmented work landscape, big workplaces have gone, that instead of single local employers, it's workplaces are crisscrossed by multiple employment contracts, perhaps divided between in-house direct employment, sometimes not even single, but multiple outsourced firms providing catering and other, and other so on. And that um, all of this means that a sort of individualistic response is as likely, if not more likely than a response of solidarity. And, and I think one of the things that's so refreshing about your book is that you really take on those arguments and effectively your book is a rebuttal of, of that kind of ultimately quite pessimistic picture. Um, and I wonder if you just expand on, you know, why you reject that and, and, and how you see things. Thanks. Um, well, first of all, yet again, it play that idea plays very fast and loose with history. Um, there's a book about the Mirth Rising in South Wales in um, 1830. Um, and it looks at the way that there were 40 separate trades, all on different paying conditions that came together to rebel against the bosses. If we look at the new, the strikes of the 1880s, again, workers on completely different conditions in different trades came together. Um, so that that ignores that ignores history but what i'd like to do is i'd just like to look at the disputes that i cover in the book because i think they show one what the british working class looks like in the 21st century and the sort of um people who've so successfully managed to um win disputes so if you just bear with me while i find these photos Okay, Mark, can you tell me whether those have come up? I'm afraid I can't see them at the moment. Okay, sorry about that. Have they, have they come up now? No, I can't see them, I'm afraid. Jane. No, okay, I'll have one more go. Of course, it was working perfectly, perfectly earlier. 
just half an hour ago. Yeah. Half an hour ago. <laughs> No, I'm going to have to do without them, which is absolutely gut wrenching as I manage as they're so inspiring. But I'll just very quickly talk about the disputes and maybe I'll manage to find them, find them later. But the first thing about the British working class is that migrant workers are central and they've led some of the most important disputes. And one of the chapters in the book looks at how migrant, migrant workers literally do the dirty work of capitalism. They're cleaning at dawn and dusk. They're passed from contract to contract by these big firms. And yet they've managed to win some absolutely amazing victories. You may know about the one at SOAS, which took 10 years gradually to win better paying conditions and then to get rid of outsourcing completely. And I haven't recently done a, looked at this, but I think now that victory has inspired workers right across London it, it, in these David and Goliath disputes at the LSE, other employers have simply, have simply caved in. So migrant workers are central. Secondly, women are also at the center of a number of really important disputes and again the strikes and struggles of, of women have been hidden from history that was the title of a book by sheila rowbottom 50 years ago and it's still true today and in the book i look at the fight of um women in birmingham who took 83 days of strike action now, these women worked in homes, they didn't work in a big factory, they were isolated, and yet they managed to get Birmingham City Council to back down completely from imposing punitive um, new contracts and, um, and slashing their wages. How many people remember the equal pay strike in Glasgow? Two days when local authority workers, mainly women, came out for two days on strike. Male colleagues wouldn't cross picket lines. The legislation just went out of the window. And again, they won a complete victory on equal pay and they won life changing sums of money for being underpaid for years and years. And, you know, these are really important. And the question that we have to ask is how can we spread these victories and why aren't equal pay strikes going on up and down at the UK? So I'm looking at the time now, so I'm going to go um, quite quickly. The interviews in the book that I do, I hope knock on the head another myth about the working class, which is about young people not being interested in trade unions and getting involved they've sort of been airbrushed out of um airbrushed out of sort of contemporary labor history but i interviewed games developers couriers so-called hospitality workers in pubs clubs and restaurants and you know young workers were getting organized getting bosses on the back foot and they were winning and even under covid um, in sheffield there's um, a, a great campaign sheffield needs a pay rise young workers picketed um, a pizza firm and they got their back pay so i'm going to have to finish there i was going to talk about teachers and university lecturers being in the um, forefront of strikes and action but i'll have to leave it there so just to conclude that question, the working class was never white, male and boiler suited, and certainly that's not the case at the moment.